Hello and welcome back to the Hansan Cast with me, Emmett Lewis, and my co-host Mikhail Christiansen. How are things going today, Mikhail? Uh, I am drinking a mana potion, so I am um, basically just recovering my uh, glorious powers um, after a very mediocre Hansan session. Um, other than that, uh, not much news. Uh, starting to prepare another big piece of paper. Um, biggest piece of paper in many years. So that's going to be. Is this the two by two meters? Yes. So it's going to be a pain in the ass. Nice. So, <clears throat> and a lot of back pain because I have to fold it on the floor and it becomes intense suffering in the lower back from all the sitting. I don't know. I think if it's origami and, you know, Japanese people apparently spend a lot of time sitting on the floor in season and stuff, I think you should, you know, suffer and really get into the art form. I mean, very few people bother folding papers that are letter, like even one times one meter is pretty big. Uh, usually uh, you'd be, a, I, usually it's much smaller and you can have it on the table. And my table just isn't big enough even for a one times one what I have in the, in the room. But um, so what you're saying is you have aspiration goals and everyone who's listening in needs to send us more money. So we can buy Mikhail a giant table. Mm. Before that, like I need, I need like a, join our Patreon. Not, no, but, but like first, I need a massive fucking room to have the table in, which means I need an apartment. So please send me all your money so I can just buy it right yeah. away. If they build it, you will come, or they will come. If anyone has a two by two meter table, possibly two point five by two point five, so there's room to have the sheet around, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And wants Mikhail to live in their house. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know. We will send them on his way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, Emmett? <clears throat> uh, I'd like to say I have left the position I was in since the last time we recorded a cast. But other than like going up to my windows to look at some junkies shouting at each mm. other, that's about it. We are. Yeah. Lockdown is continuing probably for another six weeks. Please send help. Yep. If someone wants to liberate me from Ireland, just drop in, parachute, rescue... You know, you can live out your princess, princess bride fantasies. That's fine. I'll wear a wig. It's fine with me. <laughs> Get me out of here. We need to buy to a castle in like rural Ireland some, somewhere. Yeah, that's the problem. We can't even buy places because you can't go view places at the moment. Rage. Yeah, so you're just like everyone's stuck even if they wanted to move. They're kind of stuck. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. On with today's episode before we get more lockdown mm -hmm. it's gonna be fun listening to these in the future when people are like lockdown what was mm. that <laughs> so today's episode topic is shoulders uh i suppose what do we mean by saying when you have shoulders or they have shoulders and handstands everything to do about it We're probably not going to do a knot of anatomy because you can always just that, look that up yourself we do a bit obviously but we're more interested in this idea of like what are shoulders when we say it in hand balance? Yeah. And it's an interesting thing. It's like, because we're obviously, you want to be strong, but you need to be strong in the right way for the way we want to train hand balance. Then at the same time, we have this idea that we want it to be easy. And I suppose one of the ways I always say, explain it to people is we want you to turn your shoulders into the ass yes. of the upper back. Exactly. That's basically what it comes down to. It's Very simple. Your hands are now your legs. And your shoulders are now your ass. They are your shoulders maximus. Yep. It's it's practically. I mean, I think it's. I think it, the analogy is uh, <clears throat> extremely apt in many ways because it's like first of all, um, <clears throat> uh, if you relate it to stuff, stuff such as the midsection, like the core and all this crap, like um, you want the exact same. Um, relationship as when you stand on your feet like you're not doing anything significantly different in your in your midsection when you stand on your hands and stand on your feet um, and your fingers are functioning like feet um, and the forearms like the calves and so on uh, of course there's some difference in the actual what what is the knees like that is there's they're moving in the opposite direction and so on so of course there are differences but essentially like you want the same type of stability of the structure as you have in the legs and um like when you when you stand on two arms well and you stand on two legs well it's very it's very similar like doing doing a two-arm handstand uh 
anywhere for someone who is very experienced and are ready to do it at the moment. Like it's it's a very, very simple sensation. And the standing feels just like, oh yeah, I'm just standing here and that's it. So, um, and, and kind of like, I was thinking about it earlier today in terms of this with shoulders and handstands that like, um, I was relating it back to martial, art, martial arts. I used to do karate for 10 years. Um, and if you look at most of at least the West, the Eastern martial arts, and I'm sure a lot in the Western as well, uh, and grappling and so on, a lot of stuff has to do with the hip, uh, like making, like making sure that you, that you're relating everything kind of back to your, the, the center of the body and the kind of the hip area and how you move that. And it makes sense because that is, that is where the stability is coming from. Uh, <clears throat> and that is the same like the hip in in your handstand is your shoulders that is kind of the main area where you need to to solve quite many issues in a sense yeah it's also this kind of idea that uh one of the ways i think about it is like hands like feet shoulders like hips everything else goes on top mm. and this is your kind of foundation of your handstand and when we have shoulders, it's always a thing of like having shoulders, having better shoulders. It's kind of what it can mean in some ways is the shoulders are what I look for is the shoulders are almost non-reactive to everything that happens upwards of the scapula. Mm. So it's like, oh, the shoulders, I want to bend my waist in a certain direction. The shoulders will just kind of maintain their position up until a certain point. Yeah. The, oh. And it's just like the hips. Oh, I want to hinge forward. My hips have to travel backwards. I want to pike handstand. My shoulders have to travel towards the fingers direction just because our legs are operating in the other direction now. Same with all the leg movements. I want my leg movements to basically not affect the shoulders mm. and all <clears> these <throat> kind of things. And it's an interesting thing to observe. And it's one of those things where you can start seeing. You can start, it's where I always kind of say, I can tell how good you are in a handstand by watching you do a straddle to a tuck. And this is one of the things I look out for is that the balance happens at the finger level when you're doing this transition or even in these positions. But then at the same time, as you do it, the shoulder line does shouldn't change mm. unless we're going for an archie one. It just goes, oh, my shoulder line stays around. Maybe it will go a bit more diagonal just because it is. But it's still stacked in the same relationship that it has. And it shows that if the shoulders are non-reactive in this manner, it shows you have underbalance strength or shoulder flexion strength. This is kind of what we're looking for. And it's this ability to basically maintain, if we think about shoulder flexion is hip extension in this model, what we're talking about. Hmm. So it's basically the ability to maintain your hips in an extended position without showing some kind of postular deviation. So one way to think about it is if we think about like all our kyphosis, lordosis, you know, leaning back, all these kind of things you would see in postural standing models is what we're looking for when someone has shoulders is that they don't display these kind of models happening in the handstand equivalent when they're changing between positions. Mm. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> I mean, the it, it's, um, it's also interesting just to think like not to go into kind of the at anato anatomical kind of fiddly details of it. Um, but when I think it's also like, when when you think about shoulder as a um like if you just think about the general idea of the shoulder it's very easy to just think about the shape of the deltoid as that is kind of like oh yeah that's 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 the shoulder muscle kind of and that is what signifies and represents the the shoulder area but of course there is a lot more uh to it than that and like you have I think it's like 17 muscles that connect to your scapula. Um, and like the, the shoulder is <clears throat> comprised of the entire scapular area and the, the humerus and the, um, what's it called? Clavicle. And like, there's tons of stuff there and like loads of muscles. And it's, it's this entire complex, this entire, um, uh, move like very movable joint uh, that we are referring to when we speak about like the shoulder in handstand rather than just okay you 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 need to have a big looking deltoid it is not it's not about that Us usually people that are good at handstands get the pronounced deltoid just from uh, like spending a lot of time upside down fair enough but <clears throat> just that the entire area there is very 
involved. And I think it's also the reason why I don't think it's much of a point getting too fiddly about all the anatomical details of it in terms of like, uh, this, like I mean, there there can be like we discussed in the anatomy episode. Like there can be like there are different sizes of a chromium, that are like shapes of a chromium and all this stuff. But these are things that you, unless you have X rays or MRIs of yourself, you cannot really know how they look and how everything expresses as you do it. It's kind of you 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 can't make those. Um, uh, or you, you can't make any assumptions based on just looking at how you look. What you can see is, okay, if you lift the arm overhead, like what happens? That is a, that, that is basically the level we are at when we're working. Uh, and the fewest of us can have like detailed knowledge of, of what's going on inside. Uh, but yeah, like just the idea that it's the entire joint in its... Uh, uh, in the combination that we're talking about when we're referring to this. Yeah, it's definitely one of those things that's, uh, I don't know, uh, it's even like, yes, it's not just the deltoids, but it's not just the bone. It's not just the fascia connections. It's not just the neck position. It also deals with the software. Mm. Like how well can you can control your shoulders? How well can you place them? Mm. What is happening because of your shoulder placement is one of these things. I suppose I'd like to talk a bit about some of the other shoulder things like, like say in shoulders, you said something interesting when we were just having a random chat the other day, that if you are pushing correctly during your shoulders, through your shoulders, your shoulders will achieve the right position we want them to be in. Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, talking to Lisa where we were talking about uh, how much elevation or internal rotation or external rotation. Mm. Yeah, like I think that um, yeah, th that is a good example because like, yes, there is a degree of external rotation happening when you try to lock your arms in kind of a position which is more or less close to what we want to achieve for the stacked handstand. <clears throat> you will externally rotate your arms to a degree. Uh, but uh, for some, it might certainly help to think a little bit about it, but trying to micromanage and focus way too much on externally rotating the arms, for example, overhead, like... Eh, it's not in most cases necessary because if you if you lift your arms and you flex them overhead to the position you want and you elevate your shoulders, what is going to happen for most people since it's for on average for the joint a more effective way to lock the arm inflection is through external rotation. The amount of external rotation you're going to need is going to happen. Uh, and I think that this is also something that touches on a lot of this like I think a, a point where this type of training, when, when this type of training intersects with sports science, people like to dissect it a lot, including what we do, but trying to uh, dissect it too much uh, in terms of this, like you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, uh, and you need to think about all these things at the same time, it might also be detrimental because your body is pretty smart. Like it solves the uh the issue of of staying there itself if you allow it the time the space and the the methodology to do so um so yeah it's just uh in general like focusing on scapular elevation feeling that you use your trapezius is a safer bet on average than starting to fiddle an enormous amount with the positioning and like as you get better as you get into more complex movements there might be more things to add to it but I think in the beginning, like yeah, getting making sure that you elevate the shoulders when you stand on them is kind of a very safe bet. Like no one will be worse off by trying to elevate their shoulders. But then again, if you push so high that you feel I, I like to say that if you feel that you need to grimace your face because you push so high, uh, then you're probably pushing too high. Like there there is a degree where <clears throat> where it's simply too much and you're spending more energy per second than required and needed uh, to do the same thing. Yeah, I think the elevation thing is one of these things that catches people out a lot. And obviously it comes from comes from gymnastics more so than everything else of like maximum elevation. But we do have to look at the context of that. And the context for maximum elevation takes place generally on high bar where you're not maintaining an active shoulder position. You're actually maintaining kind of pushed away for the giant swing. So they it becomes a peak shift effect where people say maximum, you know, 
maximize your elevation, get as high as possible. What I'm thinking more so for elevation, and it's changed a lot over the last while, is what I'm looking for in elevation is that you are consistently elevating your center of mass from the ground via the traps going up. So while you're pushing into the ground, you're also raising your center of mass up a certain amount. And once the center of mass is lifted, that's going to be a sweet spot for everyone. Mm. Then you're generally into a handstand zone and it doesn't need to go much higher than that. Mm. And this is kind of one of those things is like once you feel like, okay, I'm lift, literally pushing myself away from the earth and my center of mass is going up and my shoulders, my arms are staying down, they're a pillar, they're below it. Everything below above that point is going up and being lifted up via elevation. And that is one of those things. And this is why you can see people can say even one arm with different shoulder positions. Whereas if it was maximum elevation needed, then everyone would have maximum elevation, but they don't. Mm. And it can be range and then people can choose to do a bit more or not. Whereas when you see this whole shoulders up to ear, shoulders touching ears, as an example, or get them as high as you can cue. It can be good in terms of like when you're starting out learning to, I always think it's good to max out a cue, like point your toes. Well, don't just point your toes, point them as hard as they can until they cramp to feel what that's like and then mm. get in between. <clears throat> but eventually you want to like titrate down to that sweet spot where you're like, okay, my balance point is, I'm floating above my balance point and I elevate it off it. And this gives for me the balance of the vertical forces of the up and down force. Mm. And this is the kind of thing, once you are, it's like if you're actively carrying something, you can change its direction quite easy. You can control it. If something is just resting on you, so I don't know, think of someone leaning on you versus you and a friend in a kind of active balance where you're sort of counterbalancing each other. They're both easier. They're similar, but not the same. And it's the same idea here where like if I'm not lifting my center mass up and it's just resting on me, then we begin to get into the idea where the shoulders, well, they might start developing what I call power out the uh, power up the outside and it's the classic kind of resting on the shoulder joint and the arms are slightly bent and it makes a kind of arch shape if you look at it with the shoulders forming mm. a capstone yeah and it's classic in it's it's a it's very useful to be able to do it but it's also a dead end for handstand skills because you you're actively resting on the joint but you're not actively under control so you see people are quite flexible and quite good at leg movements you see a lot in yeah, I see it a lot in sort of yoga. Not so much anymore. You see a lot, but you do. We're just resting on joints. You have good control of leg movements there, but presses and one arms are basically essentially a dead end at this point because everything is going like on the outside arm of the leg mm. rather than power up the inside, <clears throat> which is what we want for more advanced stuff. I suppose. Yeah. Where yeah, it's. Um, I think also the um, just in terms of. This elevation, it, it's all. There's also a very dist important distinction to do is that uh, the if you compare the like maximal possible ev elevation versus the perceived sense of elevation um, for a beginner, those will be very similar. Like if if you're not strong on your hands and not used to lifting your your body weights with with the scapular elevation any kind of push will feel like a lot and you will feel like that you have to push as hard as you can to maintain the position and hence you will likely push quote unquote too much but for the person it'll be appropriate at the time because like the person has only two gears it's zero or it's ten uh, whereas when you get stronger you can you can literally move your shoulder up millimeter by millimeter uh, uh, slowly and back down and then you then you're start, starting to become able to find the place okay here is comfortable for me here is too high here is too low so uh, what what one wants to look for if you would kind of want to cue yourself on this hmm, given that you have the shoulder flexion required you want to see yourself on the side uh, and you just want to make sure that you're staying in a decent like as, de as decent shape as as you can and like see how low you can dip like how much you can kind of literally just depress your shoulders in a handstand <clears throat> before you see start seeing like a significant change in the posture it might arch it might planche or similar things and then you can try the same you push as high as you can and if you start seeing that 
you 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 start ending up in kind of the two open handstand where like either the the feet start going past the line and the chest goes out uh or it just feels like you're just starting to burn through more energy per second than you need then that's too high so finding some sort of middle ground there where you feel that okay you're you're using you're using this big ass muscle the trapezius for what it's worth because it can do a lot up there it's one of the main workhorses to so make sure it's doing something uh, but that it, it's working in a range where it has like it has control to go further up and it has control to lower a bit uh, whereas if you are on the maximal point possible uh, yeah you're straining a lot and you will likely not have the ability to um, to have much control and <clears throat> as you said then it like referring also to gymnastics another very important element of this very maximal elevation again in gymnastics they rarely stay in handstand for a long time per routine it's two seconds to have it qualified uh, and like but if you do a round off for example or a handspring like you want to make sure that that kind of explosive pop and and power that goes through kind of your straight arm and through your elevation of your shoulders as you use that dynamic that that is very pronounced and obviously then you're you need to be trained to push out to to that degree but then again it's it comes down to this uh, um to what we're using it for uh, so uh, yeah yeah it's definitely uh it's one of those things that's interesting if you watch gymnastics at the, if you watch gymnastics particularly men's gymnastics when they do a handstand on the floor and when they're doing a handstand deposit to get their points for a static element they normally will actually have their arms quite wide compared to where how we would place them for hand balance mm -hmm. so one of the things i spotted now obviously this is a bit of a function between the gymnastics floors are quite hard to balance on a lot of them will be slightly over on the fingers which makes it easier so their straight line is it's straight, but it's tending towards overbalance is one of the things I've noticed. And they don't really elevate their shoulders super high. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting just <clears> to see. <throat> it's one of those things like, oh, how do you make a handstand very stable for a short period of time? Lower the center mass, widen the base of support. Mm. Okay, it's just going to go there, particularly on those kind of soft spongy floors that will kill your rebalance ability. Yeah, you also see, the, see sometimes that the, the, like... The two open handstand, um, I, I've I've noticed like quite often that, and there is a very specific reason why that's an efficient position, not in gymnastics, but that's something that I've I've noticed like when they come up on the P bars, for example, which makes sense that yeah. like you you stop in your handstand on the P bar, and then just as you're going to initiate the downswing, you're going to initiate that by pushing your your shoulders out so that you get the feet behind so that the swing uh, goes maximal yeah it's kind of interesting it's one of those things that we probably should just do a documentary yeah. movie of dissecting handstand positions yeah. in different arts and explaining <clears> why you <throat> do them yeah but uh but but i yeah. think that the essential thing as we're talking about here in like the name of the episode shoulders is that all of these things has to do with where you place your shoulders uh as your you, the, the various postures you would be doing with your body would largely be up to the placement of your hips of course you can you can slouch and you can arch with your upper back that that's possible but usually to maintain balance um if you do a larger movement with your upper body it'll need to be counteracted by the hips and this is just such a a natural reaction for the body when we have walked on the legs for uh, as adults uh, and we have the knees to bend we have the waist to move sideways all of these different things that gives us like an amazing way to respond so if someone comes over and pushes you in the shoulder like you will do a very complex <clears throat> uh, coordination of moving your body in the exact motion that's needed not to fall and it's will if the, there's enough power in that push it will very likely involve your hips and this is this is why like the as we've talked about before the kind of queuing of of just squeeze your butt and uh, tense your core isn't going to do much unless uh, it's either complemented by a movement of the shoulders um, and fixing like it, it is never a fix for just an arch handstand uh, at all like what is the fix is to to understand that you will need to 
put your shoulders in a slightly different position. Um, and yeah. yeah, again, that can have to do with flexibility as well. And like, of course, a lot of like a lot of the stuff on the underside and inside the shoulder can also just be like not be used to you using those types of ranges and be too tight to to get anywhere with it. Yeah, it's funny thing. Speaking of those little things on the inside and underside of the shoulder and all this thing, it's one of those things I enjoy watching is people's backs when they're doing a handstand, and it kind of it's interesting if you look at the muscles around the scapula and you know go find some friends or look at people's back or videotape your own and just look at what's going on, particularly if you have a very good straight handstand. And just look at all these kind of asymmetric and symmetric vibrations of all these muscles pulsing on and off very quickly <clears throat> that are kind of maintaining your balance. And it kind of it counterpoints the thing of like people say, oh, make your body as tight as possible, glutes as tight as possible and all this. Whereas that kind of stuff is happening all the time unconsciously in the feet and hip level when you're standing. And then at the same time, we have it happening in a handstand. And it's kind of... It's this is part of the handstand process is installing handstand 2.0 software into your shoulders and fingers that they can actually sense the minute changes of balance and correct them fast enough before it comes a big change of balance. So it's one of these things is like when you see beginners, it's one of the things I'd like to talk about for a bit is balancing with the shoulders when people are learning to balance. And this goes into one arms as well, or the attempt to when people are you basically they're holding a handstand, but the shoulders are either moving backwards and forwards in concert with the balance. It's reacting to the big swings. It's opening, it's closing a little bit or a big bit sometimes. It's bobbing up and down. And it's a phase that I think a lot of people go through when they're learning, but it also has to be kind of eradicated as the smaller muscles in the body get stronger and more precise in their corrections. So it's kind of like we see these big ripples, big waves of balance that come up and then Shoulders go, hips go, something above reacts. But then there's a point where you can hold a, a stacked handstand, whatever shape it is, but the shoulders are still very active. They're almost controlling this horizontal rebounds. Remember the physics episode with Dr. Helgi, where he's talking about you can balance an inverted pendulum by moving the base of support horizontally. And this happens a lot, backwards and forwards, side to side with the shoulders until things get a bit calmer in there or a bit faster. Yeah. Yeah, they like it's it's uh, it's interesting to see. Like, I've had several clients lately that I've worked with that <clears throat> are um, like able to press to handstand but struggle to stay in the handstand. Um, happens. Yeah. Um, and there is this like distinct thing that like they're good in f like what I call in front of the handstand, meaning that like if they're in a half press, they can kind of stay on just brute force, like the shoulders are flexing hard enough to keep the position and it's possible to be there. Uh, but as soon as it reaches the handstand position, like there com comes these like large swings back and forth and it becomes erratic and difficult for the shoulder to maintain the positioning. <clears throat> and sometimes these things can have to do with just technique. Like if you don't have an effective way of getting there and you have too much force in the legs and so on, that can cause this kind of stuff to happen. But but what we want is like you said that this this idea that it it goes from these larger swings into kind of like just like these kind of micro twitches and pulses that uh in the end becomes as i said in the beginning becomes very similar to standing on your feet because if you stand on your feet and someone pushes you and there is like you will do this coordination and you will fix it but you have no idea how you did it or if you walked outside on the ice or something and you slipped once and like this happened to me a few days ago walked on the ice and then like like i slip and like somehow my my body throws one arm out to the side and one leg out to the side and in a millisecond i'm i'm, I'm rebalanced uh, and i don't know yeah. how i did it I, in the exact way same way as i don't know how i did my balancing on two or one arm anymore because it is ingrained and like this installation of the software basically requires us to have a conscious approach of understanding, okay, the shoulder needs to go here and I need to try to achieve this and so on and so on. So there is a conscious and intellectual process going into that. But then the 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 practice, and this is what's very important to understand both in terms of shoulders and everything, is that like the 
this it is a sensory process that you're trying to teach your body so you need to allow the body to be in a sensory state as you're learning it so if you're thinking too much like you're you're not spending uh perhaps the time optimally there and like having these like simple cues okay i'm going to go into handstand i'm going to elevate the shoulders and i'm going to try and stay here calmly can be enough rather than thinking i need to elevate the shoulders externally rotate them pull my sternum back point my toes straight my legs do 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 all these things so when you're working on yeah. all those details you might be better off using a wall for example so that you can ingrain them with uh without having to think of all of it at the same time but essentially yeah. essentially like just the the, the the more stable the shoulders are in this kind of position that we're looking for the easier it'll be to uh to to stay there for longer and do more things with it yeah it's definitely one of the things that i just had a very funny image there when you're talking i'm going to share with everyone so imagine with a, a baby when a baby's trying to learn to walk or a kid that instead of just letting them get on with it we micromanage it and we just make them do face pulls and head pulls off the wall where they have to lean their <laughs> head against the wall and then it's squeeze their toes great. exactly <laughs> it's like it's very funny but like we have to do these exercises in handstand just to build the strength and conditioning yeah. more so in the timely manner and to give you some rough tools to work with to learn to balance your handstand but uh a lot of the balance a lot of the shoulder 2.0 strategies just happen by doing it long enough and giving yourself that chance to be in that state i'm still dying with that image of kids it would be fucking yeah that's pose. so good i mean the, the 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 analogy is is kind of great as well because of course uh, a child is trying to walk on uh, a bone and muscle structure that is very uh, very evolutionary adapted to do the job um, and it watches its parents and everyone around it walk so it'll try to do it and um, so it, it doesn't need any exercises but yeah you ma imagine that like if you'd have to like no 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 now now you now you're walking wrong little baby now you need to walk exactly like this and you need to do three times five of this uh, <laughs> every <laughs> every day or else like you're, you're not doing it correctly so uh, i mean the squeeze your glutes the, baby. the the analogy of course of course it's 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 not like of course we need to learn it differently when we're trying to achieve a very specific type of handstand that's, that's not it but like the the process the neurological adaptation process to to handling this problem which is keeping the center over whatever we're staying on which is the hands will be very similar for the baby and for for uh, for us as adults yeah it kind of goes to that thing so it was straying off topic slightly but uh yeah when i'm teaching someone the one arm i'm not so much like i'm giving them exercises and drills based on what i think they need to work on but my idea and thinking of it is i'm trying to create the experience of balance and the experience of loss of balance as much as possible and that's what eventually gives them the ability to balance mm. it's not so much like oh this is a rebalance drill and that is a rebalance drill and same with like two arm handstand it's you know there's four rough ways you lose balance or shoulder position in your handstand but reality there's there's an infinite amount of them they're just kind of all micro details of the same thing so you know someone could chart that out all the ten thousand ways mm -hmm fall by 10,000 cuts but like one thing I thought to mention too about like the um the the like the shoulder stability uh because like um as I mentioned before on the cast that like I've gone through kind of um one of my more significant shoulder injuries of my career so far um the last year or so and it's been very up and down and some like been periods where I didn't feel it and gone back and forth um but what is interesting with it is that it's it's rather painless um i had many or not many but i have several injuries before where like it would be like oh shit like it hurts a lot to do this thing i can't do this thing and you just don't uh, this yeah. one is more like it's it's an issue of step like um i got it uh checked um and it, it, there is a supraspinatus tear it's not major and it's it's uh i can deal with it um i mean like it it's i can still do a full flag and i can still do a one arm press so it can't be too bad 
but it's not comfortable to do everything and it'll be very varying on day-to-day -day basis so which is why i'm now taking proper care of it to get rid of it but anyway the point is that uh, there is a distinct sensation for me that have done hand balancing for so many years and i'm so i'm so confident in many of these one arms and so on and it's it's very interesting and and of course this perturbing and frustrating but when like a, a thing cannot be done simply because like there isn't stability like i don't feel any weakness there's just like there is a point where the joint cannot do its job properly and you literally just feel like kind of this strange wobble which is distinct from making a mistake where you're like oh no i i fell out this direction or fell out that direction there's just like kind of yeah. a disconnect at a certain point and you just like float out of it um yeah. and i felt it even like it's fascinating i felt it on um uh today i was doing a few handstand push-ups and i haven't done a lot of handstand push-ups due to this lately and i felt strong in them and it felt like almost like before uh i was like hey these these push hands and push-ups are really easy but what was very interesting was that like i was wobbling on the way up and i was wobbling on the way down and when i made it to handstand like on two arms i was like whoa it this this moves a lot more than it should um and it's obviously connected because like when i do a handstand push-up i stand in handstand i bend my arms i straighten my arms no big deal like i do it enough times until i tire and then it stops and i fall that is that is how a handstand push-up would fail for me <laughs> but here there like there is this strange sensation of like you come up like your arms are almost straight from the handstand push-up like you just haven't locked in kind of that full handstand yet and you feel your shoulders like kind of traveling a bit back and forth in this strange way um and this is just very interesting because my software is obviously very trained it has done handstand push-ups for handstand 3.0 huh? handstand software 3.0 yeah basically it's 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 highly trained for like 12 years so it knows very well what to do but here there is like here there is a hardware failure in a very specific place which then i would assume creates kind of a cascading effect of of um things not um not functioning um and this is of course like i mean a lot of people that train handstands at any level will go through similar things but and most of you that are training your handstands now in the beginning you shouldn't think that oh the reason i can't hold the two arm yet must be because you have the same issue as me no it's not it's not that but um like i just thought of it as an interesting kind of analogy and also speaking about this yeah. with, with with shoulders like the physio uh, did a scan on my most of my entire shoulder like he couldn't see the labrum and stuff but from seeing the bicep tendon he assumed that it was intact enough but there was a tear on the um, on the supraspinatus uh, and rather small wound infraspinatus all the others were fine uh, and just that uh, and he, he said that, that he had had loads of clients like athletes like just having a similar kind of injury and, and experiencing kind of a drastic loss of strength or ability or like handball players, for example, throwing and so on. Yeah. Uh, that just like they grab the ball and it's like, I'm just going to throw this ball hard, but it's just, it just isn't there. Um, and this is, this is so, such a clear thing uh, when, when just like a little tiny thing isn't functioning in there as it should and like, it kind of falls down like a stack of cards. Yeah. It's one of those things that's the good phrase what generally relates people use it for squatting and other stuff. I mean, like talking about leg size and you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. Mm. Well, the general saying is you need really big legs to be really strong. Fair enough, it's probably true. But it's one of these things It's like a canoe is inherently unstable. I've done a canoeing course recently during the summer. It was weird to think, but we actually got out to do a canoeing mm. course. But I learned to canoe, and by saying I learned to canoe, I mean I learned every way you can capsize a mm. canoe, and drowned, and you know nearly died one time, which was fun. I don't recommend it, but anyway, yeah, I uh, canoes are very inherently unstable, but they're very maneuverable. But it's the same thing of like if you go too strong with your stroke on the canoe, you fall over, and it's basically the same thing with the shoulder. And what you're describing there, like someone wants to throw a ball really far, well that's a cannonball. But they have no stability in their canoe, so the body's not going to allow it to happen. And it's probably the exact same thing what you were talking about there. It's like, oh, you're wobbling, you know, you're not able to do your heavy tricks 
Why? Because you're trying to launch a cannonball, and unfortunately, your canoe's got a hole in it. Mm. So, we need to plug that hole. Yep. <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah, like just in terms of the, um, yeah, the, the analogy to to the hip um, is kind of um, pretty strong, and of course, like the hip is a really sturdy joint because of the entire capsule and so on. And the interface between the labrum and the actual head of the humerus is a lot smaller. And we have the rotator cuff that needs to deal with the stability of the entire um, <clears throat> entire shoulder. And like from my experience, most of the time people that injure their shoulders from handstands, like it's the external rotators that, that take the hit. Um, it's been the, ca the case for me in practically all of the times I've had injuries. And most other people I know as well as has had similar injuries then of course like the, the rotator cuff is a highly specific joint and like a loads of different things can then give the different similar symptom symptoms and so on but very important to to just know that like it is handstands is ultimately about the control of this joint that is that is how you get good at handstands is by having good control of this joint because the things that your hands do for example like of course you're going to be balancing with your fingers for a lot of your handstand time but the job the fingers learn is exactly the same from day one until day a hundred thousand because like it'll be squeeze the fingers when force comes forwards and don't squeeze the fingers when force doesn't come forwards uh, so it's very of course you need more and better control on one arm but there isn't like there isn't much you need to learn about how to respond with your hand it's simply respond with your hand whereas the shoulder needs to be placed in a very specific way for various things and it needs to maintain that control as you change uh, shapes for example and as you come over to one arm anyone that's done for example a straddle to tuck one arm or a once like a straddle one arm to a straddle flag or something like that they will know very clearly this like that you just you just need to keep the shoulder there at all times as you're do doing this motion same thing goes for presses and other kinds of things, two arms, um, but it's 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 essentially being able to keep this shoulder in the position that you want it to, to be in for the movement that you want to do, whether that is a handstand push up, a lower down to a planche, a one arm, a two arm, or whatever. Like it's it's keeping that relationship between the hand and the shoulder uh, as um, how to say as um, constant as possible, like with ideally in hand yeah. balancing context with the least amount of change of that sh of that shoulder placement through almost whatever you do except if it's if it's planchy then it's basically the only time where you on purpose want it to to move somewhere else and hands and push up yeah yeah that's pretty good there's one thing you kind of touched on there it's a interesting thing with the corrections i suppose and maintaining the shoulder position is like when the correction wave comes from the hand and travels through the shoulder you want it to go straight through it and not get stuck and make the shoulder vibrate mm. and cause more corrections and that's one of the key things to look at shoulder is like a hollow tube instead of a i don't know a spring i suppose uh with that i think we should move on to some questions yes. so first question we have a question from frederico a voice question which i will hopefully be able to play Hi, Emmett and Michael. I wanted to thank you for all the information you're sharing on this podcast. And uh, I have a question about external rotation. Is it possible that regardless of what I do with my shoulders, if I don't think about externally rotate them, um, I cannot stay in handstand? While if I think so, it becomes the easiest things in the world. Uh, is it possible? And how much do you should externally rotate uh, in uh, handstand? Thank you. Mm, yeah, it refers a bit back to what we we spoke about yeah. earlier in the episode. But um, now I'd like to be. I'm not a hundred percent clear what is meant. Uh, but of course, like if it is so that you can't handstand at all if you don't concentrate on externally rotating, and you can. When you're externally rotating, well, then that is what ha that is what's happening, and that is relevant for you. Uh, whereas, like, 
I did hand balancing for many years, many years before before I started researching what was going on in the shoulders. And I even knew about, oh yeah, external rotation. That is that thing. Like, like that's something I never ever thought about until I done handstands for like five years or so. So it's yeah. it's not um it's it's not a necessary cueing as long as you're like as I said before, it kind of if you're doing uh, if you have the shoulder flexion required and you're doing you're elevating the shoulders properly, you will kind of by default be externally rotating to a degree. So I kind of like to say elevate the shoulders, avoid internally rotating your arms because if you avoid internally rotating your arms, you are likely uh, uh, doing the amount of external rotation that is required to do a handstand. And like most people, if you would lift your arm above your head, if you would grab your scapula and you'd lift your arm above your head, you'd find that your your um, your infraspinatus, you, you can feel your infraspinatus, you will feel that it is tense. Whereas if you internally rotate your arm above head, you'll feel that it kind of softens up a bit and then you externally rotate again and you can feel oh, it. Yeah. We're both waving our arms yeah, around here. Both waving our arms on, on the podcast. I'm I'm still in, on in Sauron's Tower. And Emmet is on the Death Star um, on, as our background, but yeah. no, we're just literally on. The yeah, very, very, very <laughs> important. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's um, to like to what degree should you externally rotate? Like a, a perfect test for this. If, again, if you lift your arm and you hold it above your head and you just externally rotate as much as you can, you will notice that you will start to like you, you like you will not be able to maintain the same kind of flexion because the the tension on the of the supraspinatus will make it very hard to keep the actual um flexion of the arms. So like externally rotating way too much is just going to bring your shoulders forwards, uh, which isn't what you want. You want to lock the joint in an effective position and your super like your super spinatus and your infraspinatus's job up there is to, is to lock the joint in the position in in a uh, externally rotated placement so f- to me it's one of these things that it's like not too much point overthinking yeah i think the the quickest field test for how much external rotation does your personal shoulder need would be to hang your arms down by your side make Basically, you could hold two pens just to see it. And you stand by your side and you let the arms hang directly in line with the torso. If you're holding two pens in your fist, they should point parallel. And if they turn inwards, maybe that's too much. If they turn outwards, maybe that's too, or that's too little, that's too much. So that gives you a baseline of neutrality in the shoulder. Then lifting the arm up overhead and replicating that position. So maintaining the external rotation, just go straight up into flexion then push, elevate, and then see how it feels. That will give you a baseline to start from. And then from there, all you'd have to do would be internally rotate the forearm to get the hand placement. Yep. That's one way to do it. It's kind of one of these fiddly ways Then work with. But it, it is one of these things like it, when people say, oh, I must maintain external rotation and how much, I'm more interested to see what would happen when they don't do it because a lot of time they might just be losing the push and opening the shoulders too much would cause them to internally rotate. Mm-hmm. So I see that a lot in that kind of position. That contributes to the power out the power up the outside position as mm-hmm. well. So it is once again your body, your choice, and you have to figure out how to make it work. And no one is really there's always guidelines and generalities, but you have to get at what works good for you might not be the cueing that works for someone yep. else but on average elevate your shoulders make sure that you're you're not allowing the elbows to escape a lot out to the sides and like because an internal rotation in handstand will usually be accompanied accompanied me with like the the elbow rotating outwards and the arms bending because that will be the most effective way of staying in handstand with an internally rotated arm and again don't overthink yeah. it Cool. Uh, our next question is a good one, actually, because it kind of wraps it up nicely. In one of the episodes, Mikhail and Emmett reference different shoulder positions in one arm position, regular straddle, one arm, flag, one arm, fika. I'd be curious to hear more about that. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, that's kind of it, it. It ties neatly into or from what we just spoke about. Like, interestingly enough, when you start doing one arms, like there will be more 
like like thinking about external rotation uh, more like a little bit more on an active side actually might help since you want to center the arm more underneath the hip and you're uh, of course having a lot more pressure on the arm and the arm can move in all kinds of planes and so on um so yeah like for, for i usually unless you also add kind of the the contortion family i like to speak about four different shoulder positions like it's the straight for all the straight one arms which is one arm straddle one arm tuck diamond is like legs together and all kinds of variations where like your body slightly diagonal your shoulders like elevated solid and you kind of have this kind of diagonal body uh, and if you would stay in that position and straddle and then just move the legs into various positions that should ideally not move the shoulders so much and not move the body like the body and shoulder position should be similar then you have the figa position uh, or to go back uh, the the basic position wants to kind of have the shoulders on more or less a horizontal line so we keep the the free arm also elevated uh, so like the hips are tilted the the shoulders pushed out the free arm is also keeps the shoulder elevated um but the figa versions then you're actually pushing much higher in the the balancing shoulder and you will see on people that do figa that the free arm the free shoulder will be up on a diagonal like the free shoulder will be above the other arm because you're piking at the hips and twisting at the hips mm. and you need this extra high push to be able to to get your legs low and it's kind of one of the kind of secrets of figa that like you don't just pull your legs down you actually push higher in the shoulder too to allow this and this is why doing for example legs together figa is a very heavy thing because you need to like that's that's the position where you need to maximally elevate your shoulder because if you don't you're going to have a miserable time with it then you have flags yeah. where like flags are a bit like varying on on different people some people will uh like depending on like rib structure and like side flexibility and back flexibility and all kinds some people will be able to maintain the arm very close to their heads and just bend very neatly at the hips and the shoulder position will virtually look unchanged but you will usually feel it in a different way and you will feel as if the shoulder is sinking even though you're elevating very hard against it some people will have to bend their arms if they go too far some people might just keep the arm straight and move it away from the head and you will you will see the very different structures on people there you you have some of the the beastliest uh, superheroes like Andriy Bondarenko for example like if you see his full flag his his arm will be a little bit away from his head like it'll be kind of diagonal uh, um and I bet that there are very few people in the world who are as strong on kind of flags and presses and stuff as him. Um, yeah. And then you have kind of the the press variation, which is similar to a flag, but since you're piking at the hips, there is like there is more demand on external rotation in those uh, than in flags in general. Uh, if you are very if you have a crazy good pike, you you can mitigate that significantly. Um, but that shoulder position kind of you need to reach a lot with the free arm uh, as you're piking to be able to to counteract the forces of the legs starting to come down a little bit in front of the body um, so like it's hard to explain without loads of diagrams and an entire episode just yeah. on that but like that is kind of the gist of it yeah probably an idea for a shoulder one there's one i just like to add into that or one I, a little observation so the higher the shoulder, the less the diagonal angle of the hips and spine. So it's one of those interesting ones when we start talking about shoulder position and height is it also does depend on proportions, arm length and torso length and leg length and all this as well. But if you can get the shoulder, if your comfortable shoulder position is higher, then you will need less of a diagonal angle. You can be more close to horizontal with mm. the hips, whereas the lower the position and the further away from the ear, Far away from the ear is a bit of a tricky one to judge because hyperextension can mask this one. The more of a diagonal angle you have in your handstand, mm. that would be uh, my little contribution to that. Yeah, the one of the other ones is like, I I don't know, if you look at the people I teach who can do Svechka, Morgan is a good example of this, Morgan Lee on Instagram, I think. But uh, so anyone else who can do Svechka, I teach it with a slightly higher shoulder position than their other shapes and it also gives an almost weird 
reverse flag look yeah like to it. the inwards yeah because it's yeah because they flag inwards i found it's just like it's just a tiny bit it's not a lot but it found is like having a straighter line along that side seems to make it balance sooner mm. there's definitely a two is doing good touch because harry banks i'm not sure if he has any videos that's the kind of thing a lot of people are trying just don't post enough videos there's more <laughs> videos guys but uh harry banks well he's got a quite a nice one you can see it clearly on them as well it's like instead of it almost looks like the curve most people have between the hip and the waist flattens out along that mm. side. And that's kind of, it's in a side effect of the shoulder position. It's not me actually putting the body in the position, but it's just to get the required push to hold the swetchka. Yeah, it, 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 it can that certainly be effective, like particularly for that position because you have the arm up by the side as well. So you have very little weight on kind of on that side of the body. And if, if you then... Uh, if you start flag like going into kind of a flaggy or more flaggy shape in in legs together arm up you have problems and it is really hard to yeah. catch and that's why like keep like being able to keep this very precarious zone um with a very high shoulder push is is effective for that position then again like it's also one of those that like it will depend a little bit on the person but on average like legs together arm up is 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 very inconvenient and uh like rough <laughs> to do with, the with with any kind of flagged uh, or dropped shoulder position and that's it's been interesting like with my shoulder injury thing like there have been days where like i can like when i have a bad day and like the shoulder just can't elevate and can't push and i've tried to train you can just see that like it just doesn't look like it usually does like there's a kind of this like hang yeah. in the shoulder which is every time i see it like I can't really even. It's as if like, huh? Well, what's going on? Like, this is me, but what's, what, what is this? Because I'm, of course, I've seen a million videos of myself doing the thing, and suddenly here's like, oh, but there's something just like, not right here. Like, what is going on? Because my perceived effort of elevation, is the same. Like, it's the same, yeah. but like the body can, like the body just has a different max. Like, it cannot elevate to the normal point. Um, it elevates to lower, but it 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 has the perceived um, effort of the same. So it's it's very very interesting. Yeah, it's definitely one of these. Uh, yeah, shoulders. I think I've hit all the points I wanted to yeah. cover today. Yeah, there's. Yeah. All right, cool. Like. Uh, yeah, sure. We wrap this up. So if you want to submit some questions to us, you can send them to us at Hansan Factory on Instagram, or directly to me, Mikhail. Uh, you can also, if you want to do a call in, you can find us on anchor.fm. You can find us on handstandfactory.com, and there's a link to the podcast there, which will take you to Anchor. You can do a call in, give us a voice message. Uh, as you know, we've got a new format for this season where we are sort of grouping questions with episodes that suit them. So your question might not get answered week to week, but it will definitely get, get to it at some point. Uh, other than that, I've been Emmett Lewis, and that was Mikhail Christiansen. The Handstand Cast is brought to you by Handstand Factory and is produced by Motion Impulse. Thanks for tuning in. You can find a full transcript of each episode along with the show notes and any relevant references on handstandfactory.com slash podcast. Thanks to Isaac for editing and Jordan for transcriptions. Music by Daniel Horwath. If you want to support the show, you can buy us a coffee on buymeacoffee.com or consider starting one of our Handstand Factory online programs. Links are in the show notes.